Today, I sit down with the incredible Mafe Anzuris. At just 16, she started her own clothing line, Molly the Brand, which she has now been able to leverage into her full-time business. With over 300,000 followers across all platforms, Mafe is able to spread the message of healing your inner child and improving your mental health, not only through her clothing brand, but also through her incredible podcast, The I Missed Me Podcast. Today, we discuss the importance of having faith in yourself, the power of manifestation, finding mental peace, and much more. If you enjoyed today's conversation and you want to see even more incredible conversations with amazing guests, please follow along and leave a rating is the best way to help me grow the show. And I cannot thank you enough for being a supporter. Thank you for tuning in to the R20s podcast. Without further ado, Mafia and Zuris. Let's start at the beginning. You've been incredibly open on, on your podcast about how much your family impacts your life. And from everyone that I've interviewed, one of the key fundamentals towards finding success is they have a support system, whether that's their yeah. family or whether that's some family, friend, anyone exterior. Just tell me about your family life in the beginning when growing up. How important is the relationship that you have with your parents, with your sisters in terms of just how you got to this point right now? Yeah, well, first of all, my parents are my best friends. My sisters are my best friends. And I can't be more grateful about the family that the universe decided to to give me. They're like such a gift. And my parents have been extremely supportive since I was little, like, they always forced, I have two sisters, they always like forced us to play a sport because um, it requires discipline and it, it builds discipline and it teaches you how to be disciplined and how to be positive and how to, you know, all of that stuff. So growing up, we had to play a sport. And one thing that my dad would always say is like, in this household, until you move out, you are not allowed to say that you can't do something. And that's something that my sisters and I, like, till this day, we, like, repeat constantly. It's, like, our dad always said, like, we can do anything and everything that we, like, put our minds to. And, I mean, everything, like, I, I can talk about my parents, like, literally all day because I have a clothing brand and my first supporters were my parents. Um, my dad literally gave me all the tools to start until this day he... He is my like number one fan, my manager, my everything. My mom like will support me no matter what. So it's like that encourages me and that gives me so much motivation to keep going and to be like, I don't have to worry about anything else other than what I want to do because I know that I have their support like no matter what. And that has also given me a lot of like free will and like self motivation of like, I don't have to worry about like anything else, you know what I mean? So it's like, I know that it's tough to grow up in a household where it's like you have rules and you have to wait till you move out to start your projects. And like, you have to like kind of postpone your plans because you don't have that support. I didn't have that. So, I mean, and that's why I started a clothing brand since I was like 16. And that's why I started this podcast without like any type of fear. And that's why I started posting on social media without like having to hide it from my parents or anything. Or I can go out without having to like lie about where I'm going. It's just like all of those things that I I feel so much at peace that I'm doing things right. And then my parents know that. I mean, yeah, I'm just so it blessed. It means the world. My, my parents are the same exact way. Mm-hmm. I, I think the difference for me was... At 16, I was not confident enough to, to be able to <laughs> flat out. I just could not find that self-confidence. But my parents are my biggest support system. And we were the exact same way. We, we weren't necessarily required to play a sport, but they were heavily mm-hmm. encouraged. I played baseball growing up all throughout school. And same kind of ordeal. It was competing at a very high level from a very young age. And I had certain values instilled in me that I think a lot of mm-hmm. athletes have instilled in them. And it seems that was the way with you with tennis. I mean, you were competing yeah. at a very high level. Your, your high school team made states four years in a row while you were there you know that wow that's crazy <laughs> I didn't have to do my homework uh, <laughs> you're, you're competing at a very high level from a very young age and you're having these same values instilled in you that absolutely carry over in different endeavors which i've mm. noticed in myself now that i've graduated post my playing career onto a more professional career what did you notice in yourself when you're first starting molly the brand when mm. you are trying to shift mindsets a little bit, starting selling new in business. But a lot of mm. that experience in athletics is going to carry over. Do you notice any specific lessons from athletics that carry over? To oh, so business? many. And it's funny because 10-year-old me would have never thought that I would be doing this right now because everything that I do is around positivity and healing and becoming your best friend and self-growth. And like, 
I love myself so much now and I'm my best friend, but I grew up hating myself because of tennis. I grew up hating myself and being super insecure and talking so bad to myself and just so insecure because of the sport. And it's like, I thought that I was a loser and I thought that like I would never get anywhere in life because I would lose matches. And it's like, you can talk to yourself badly growing up, whatever you're in your house and like your parents are going to tell you that like everything's going to be okay, whatever. But like once you hit real life is like if you talk ne negative to yourself, like there's nobody, nobody's going to come and save you, you know? Yeah. So it's like, I think that starting my business was like that reality check of like, if you don't change your mindset, your life's going to stay the same. Um, and so, yeah, I would, I, I was super insecure and I literally hated myself growing up and, and playing the sport because of like my results. Like obviously you're never going to win, but I didn't at the time understand that. And I started my business from scratch and it's like, if I didn't, if I wasn't getting any results, I would get super frustrated And I would start, ne start like that negative talk to myself like I had always with tennis. And then eventually it's like you can talk negative to yourself like all you want, but like nothing's going to happen, you know? Yeah. Like if you, if, if you give up with this business, it's not going to get you anywhere. So it's like that was my mindset shift of like I can't, I can't keep doing this. Or, like I can't keep giving up. I can't keep destroying myself I can't keep hating myself if I want to su to be successful to succeed and so I feel like that was the biggest lesson of like if you if you don't change your mindset your life is never going to change and you're never going to be successful and then ironically enough I have a podcast on how to become your best friend and my brand is all about self-growth and and healing but I would not see that transformation or I would not know what a healing journey looks like if I hadn't been through that phase of like hating myself and being super insecure and whatever. Yeah. You got to go through the hard times to mm -hmm. really appreciate the good times is something I've mm -hmm. come to recognize myself. I have this, I have a very similar type of story. I, I borderline was distraught with myself when I was playing baseball. Yeah. Uh, the way it would work is we would drive to all these camps to get looked at by colleges. I can remember so vividly, I was driving to Brown University, which was like four hours from my home. And I'm like an hour into the car ride. And I look at my dad, and I just start like crying in the car. And meanwhile, I'm like 17 years old. I'm like, dad, turn around the car. I can't go. And he's like, what do you mean? Like, we're already on the way. And he's like, no, yeah. I, I can't go. Like, I'm not, I'm not in the mood to do this. Like, I'm not confident in my skills right now. And we turned around the car. And it was the same kind of ordeal. Like, I just was not confident in myself. And thinking upon that beginning point, I have to recognize in myself, there's something deeply wrong within myself that I have to recognize and I have right. to grow upon and you have to get to that point. And you clearly did that with your clothing brand. You were able to start something incredible at such a young age. And for anybody who's looking at it from an outsider's perspective, they just see, oh, maybe one video blew up on Instagram, on TikTok, and that was a start. Like that's how mm -hmm. uh, this all happened for you. But that's, that's never the case for anybody yeah. who's getting started in business. Mm -hmm. Can you talk about that beginning phase where you have to work in the dark? You have to be the only person who knows what you're doing. And you have to be fully committed to something that maybe a lot of people on the outside don't understand. What did that teach you about yourself on your on your journey to understanding yourself and what you really valued? Yeah, well, first of all, that I'm capable of doing anything that I put my mind into. And yeah, like you said, like a lot of people are like, oh my gosh, you gained 50,000 followers from like in one night from one video or like whatever, like TikTok can blow you up. But like what they don't know is that it took me six months to get to that video that blew up. And I started... Um, buying clothes at a thrift store and cropping them and selling them on Depop. And then I bought a, an embroidery machine and I had to learn how to use that. And I had to buy boxes at the Dollar Tree to like ship two packages a month. It's like, it wasn't really from night to morning. And I am so blessed that it eventually happened. But I did have to go through um, meetings with uh, creative uh, designers and like, I did have to go through meetings of like how to grow your Instagram, how to grow on social media, how to like, I, I just had like a lot of different meetings, a lot of different teachers, a lot of, a lot of different like lessons and, and classes of like how to build a business that again, I'm so blessed that my dad had all, all these contacts that he was able to connect me with all of these amazing people to start. But it was, it wasn't just a, a video on TikTok. It was, it, there was a whole, 
process on, on how to like build a brand. And like I said, it, it did demonstrate me that if I have an idea, I have to work towards that idea and not give up because it will happen. And that's how it was kind of with, with my clothing brand. And that's why I started this podcast so confidently. And like, there was no doubt in my mind that people were going to listen. Like, I didn't know how, I didn't know if it was going to be through TikTok, through reels, through just grinding on social media, but I knew that my podcast was going to be heard and, and it is, and I am so grateful, but I'm also not surprised because that's what I stated before starting. People love to call it something along the lines of irrational faith in yourself <laughs> that you believe that you have something and you have a goal and you're going to see it too through fruition, no matter what the cost is. I don't really like to use the term irrational because it's rational in your own head. You have yeah. the self-belief that yeah. it, it's true. Like if you don't believe in yourself, then you're not going to do it in the first place. Yeah. It's amazing to see someone so young be able to have that kind of a belief in themselves. Mm -hmm. I, I alluded it to earlier. I could never do something like this, start a podcast, try to even, I didn't have a social media account until I started this podcast because I was so <laughs> against just even putting a little bit of myself online. I was just that self-conscious with myself. I didn't want to potentially you know, ruffle feathers or somebody right. didn't like something that I did. Mm -hmm. you're, you're doing this when you're in high school. And yeah. if I meet high school, me tried to do this. Oh boy. I would have, <laughs> I would have bullied myself out of the building. <laughs> that <would've been> <laughs> How do you go about it? Because it's so different even when you go to college or you, when you're not even in college at this point, you're just on your own and you're doing your own thing. You don't have to listen to outside voices when you're in high school, when you're in college, it's a bubble. And those voices are just bouncing off the walls and they're coming back at you. How do you go about staying confident? Cause I'm sure there's a lot of people listening who are in that bubble right now who are struggling with their confidence and they don't know how to escape the noise or tune out the noise to begin with. Mm -hmm. How do you go about on your journey, just tuning out the noise in, in that initial phase? Well, my biggest lesson about confidence is that confidence is a consequence of how many times you do something, right? So if you never start, you're never going to be confident. And it's like, it's with everything with people that want to start going to the gym, but are insecure of people looking at them or want to start posting on social media, but are like shy of of, like people are going to think that you're cranky is like if you don't start you're never going to build up confidence it's like confidence is not something you wake up with confidence is something that comes after doing something for a repeated amount of time and that's why like when you start going to the gym you go a week you go two weeks you go three weeks and after the fourth week you're like same people go every day people don't really care that much I'm doing this for me um same with social media like people will watch a 15 second video think that I'm cringy and then they'll scroll and they'll forget about me like first of all we have to humble ourselves a little bit and like remember that everyone is living their own lives and that they don't think about this 24 7 <laughs> and if they do that's kind of crazy <laughs> that's kind of <Yeah>. creepy <laughs> and also if you wait because of if you wait to do your stuff because of other people's opinions then you're postponing your success and that's a dishonor to you. And that's very unfair, like to yourself. And it's like, you're caring more about others than about yourself. And that's really sad, you know? Yeah. So absolutely. yeah, yes. My biggest lesson with confidence has been like, it, it's a consequence of how many times you do something. So you're never going to be confident if you never start. Beautifully said. Mm -hmm. And I, I've recently had a, a change of heart, in my opinion, on the concept of regret where I used to say, oh, I don't have regrets. I, I got started at the exact time that I was supposed to get started and everything happened the way that it should have. And I kind of am embracing those regrets a little bit more than I used to, where I do regret not being as confident as I was because I wish I would have gotten started earlier. And I think it's a positive thing to embrace those regrets. And I think it's a big takeaway that anybody listening should hear that you're only hurting yourself mm -hmm. if you're not taking action today when you could be. I love that you talk about regret because I genuinely believe that regret is beautiful. Because it's like regret turns into motivation of like, I regretted this once. I'm not going to regret it again. You know, like regret is yep. such a heavy feeling to feel that I don't want to feel it again. So now I'm going to do it. Yeah. And I think it speaks to emotional intelligence where people love to suppress certain emotions in, yeah. in, the, in the guise that they're really trying to understand what they're feeling. I talked about this a bit. I did an episode on loneliness, which you've done too, which was mm -hmm. phenomenal, by the way. Thank um, you. <laughs> no problem. Loneliness was something that I tried to suppress for a very long time where I didn't want to truly understand the feelings that I had because I wanted to tell myself, oh, no, I'm just improving myself. I don't need to worry about an any emotions that I'm feeling uh, with loneliness when it comes to not having a, a, a girlfriend or a partner in my life. Mm -hmm. it's something that I don't need to worry about right now. 
And it wasn't until I fully embraced that emotion that I could truly understand what I was feeling and what was going on. And it helped me get to this next phase that I am in my life. With your emotional intelligence, you are so open and honest in all of your podcast episodes that you're able to convey these really tough emotions mm -hmm. that a lot of people are asking you about all the time. They're constantly asking different types of questions about a wide spectrum of emotions that we all feel. How are you able to rationalize your own emotions in a day-to-day -day setting? Is it something that you have to do, like you have to be in a quiet setting and you just have to really think about and you have to be in tune with who you are? Or is it more come over time? It's something gradual that has to build up and then you can finally pinpoint and say, this is what I am truly feeling. It's tough. And I appreciate the question because I don't feel like I share my own emotions enough and I try to help people as much as possible. But when you have to, hurt, you when you have to help yourself, it's, it's, it's generally like tougher but I do have a lot of conversations with myself um d daily and it's like not because I'm emotionally intelligent means that I don't make mistakes you know or that sometimes I don't fall into like old habits that I have or that I don't struggle because I I do I have I just become better every single day at managing those emotions and it's like and that's what I share and that's why I'm so open like online and like vulnerable with like the 300,000 people that listen to me it's like I'm not embarrassed because I know that I'm not the only one feeling this way and if I and if people start relating to me then they won't feel as lonely anymore is it tough for me to handle my emotions it is but I've learned how to be very patient with myself of like it doesn't mean that not because I have a podcast um about like becoming the best version of yourself means that I have to be perfect every single day. Like that's not what it means. I'm still a person and I'm still growing and I'm still healing from a lot of things. And I talk to myself every single day and I'm like, tomorrow is going to be better. Or how did I do today? Or what am I going to do tomorrow to be better every day? Like I still ask those questions. And I said that story on my podcast, like the, the way that I healed was by recording myself and having conversations with myself. And that's something that I still do. And when I have hard days, I will still record myself on my phone, even if I don't post it anywhere, like whatever. But like, I still have that relationship with myself. That was something when I first heard it, I loved because <laughs> I, I thought it was so different and it was interesting. It's basically like a verbal form of a diary where you're able exactly. to come back to it at a future date. And when you're in a state that maybe you feel like you haven't been in in a while or you, you forget how it felt, you can look back on it and you can say to yourself, yeah. oh, I, I did feel this way. And this is exactly. how I rationalized it at the yeah. time. And for me, I've, I've tried journaling before and it, it just wasn't working for me where I felt like I was just talking to myself and talking to myself wasn't the key to understanding my emotions. Once I started doing the podcasting, when I first started, I was just talking to the camera, just me and the wall. But even that felt better because I was actually saying it out loud as opposed to just writing it down. And it's kind of like when you're in English class and you're like writing down a sentence and then your teacher says, all right, now read this out loud to actually make sure it makes sense. And then you read it back <laughs> and it's like, oh, there was a fire in the fire and the fire was a fire. And you're like, oh, that doesn't really make any sense. When you say it out loud, it just, you bring it out into the universe. You're telling mm -hmm. the universe, like, this is how I'm actually feeling. And it's just a whole different game changer. Another thing that you've talked about that I love that you do is on a monthly basis, you reflect upon the month and you write down how you're going to change or how you're going to prepare for the next month. We're approaching April. Can you give an example of what might go in to something that you're going to write down for what you're going to reflect upon for March and how you're going to prepare and change anything that you might need to for April? Um, well, I did have situations and in, in March, well, March is not over, but where I did have to put myself first and kind of sacrifice some things for for others that would benefit myself and I I'm always so scared to say no to plans because I'm like scared that they're not going to invite me anymore or that yeah. I will always put a hold because I work from home and I decide my own schedule of like I have to make these amount of hoodies and I have to record these amount of episodes but my friend invited me to go somewhere I will put this on hold because I will go with my friend and when I come back home I can finish my stuff and it's like your stuff is more important than hanging out with you know like you have priorities for yourself and it's like projects for yourself and they're not going to grow if you keep like postponing them because you want to go out with your friends and like I'm always so scared to say no because I don't want to get uninvited to places and, and March has really taught me like you have to put yourself first your priorities come first and if your friends really love you they're not going to stop inviting you to go okay. to places um 
putting myself first, my projects and, and my goals and yeah, just like sacrificing some things in order to benefit myself and and things that I that I'm going into April, I really haven't thought about them. I I usually think about them like by the end of, of the month, but it's definitely like maintaining my my peace. Um maintaining my healthy diet that I've been I've been changing and I've been eating a lot more healthier and yeah. exercising. Um staying consistent with that. But I my biggest thing right now and f- f- like March and April and like the whole year is just maintaining myself present and like living in the present moment. And I, I like to look forward to things to feel excited all the time to not like, you know, I I like to like in April, I'm going to travel and in May I'm going to travel and then whatever, I'm going to do this and I'm going to do that. And it's like, I forget about what I'm living right now. Um, so not looking forward to things, but living in the present moment and realizing that there's nothing wrong with right now. So there's nothing wrong with staying present. Absolutely. Staying present is something that I've asked a lot of guests and just a lot of friends in general conversation. And it's something that's so hard to be able to describe how you're able to do it effectively. Yeah. And one of the ways that I've loved how you've described success is you describe success as being at peace with what you're doing. Yeah. And I don't think you can be at peace until you are truly grateful for the moment and everything that you have. You've talked about how you've built upon gratitude before. And you read The Secret, which I think I'm just going to go pick up at the nearest Barnes & Noble like tomorrow. Like, you Please. You a great sales pitch <laughs> for uh, watching the documentary on Netflix and picking up the book. Spirituality as a whole is something that when young people especially are open to talking about, I'm just enthralled because it's become more reserved amongst our generation. It's not as open as it used to be where people are open about their beliefs. And you talking about just the impact that manifestation has had on your life and truly being in tune with the universe is mm. something that I find incredibly fascinating. Can you just describe for the audience who might not be familiar with how manifestation works for you? Because it can be different in, in, people's, yeah. di- in different perspectives. How does it work for you personally? What's your go-to type of routine, if you want to call it routine, or just what's your go-to in terms of when you need to sit down and you need to be grateful in the moment, how do you go about manifesting something for the future or just manifesting in terms of being grateful for the moment yeah and I'm so glad that you brought up the secret because I recommend it to every single person that I meet like you have to read it or watch the documentary on Netflix because it will change your mindset like completely and some people like to call it manifestation or like asking the universe whatever for me it's just gratitude the more gratitude that you have towards something the more of that that you will receive and the less gratitude that you have towards life even what you have will be taken away because you can't even see it you know, so manifestation for me has been how grateful are you for the things that you have? You will receive like more of that. And I, I try to stay gra- grateful about like every single thing in my life because I know that I will receive more of that. And that's how I go into projects of like, I'm so grateful that this podcast is being successful. I'm so grateful that my brand blew up. I'm so grateful that I hit 200,000 followers on TikTok. And it always happens because I feel grateful about it as if I already had it. And it's funny because I was thinking about um, this this morning. It's like people have this misconception that manifestation is like writing something 10 times on a paper and then putting it under your pillow and like sleeping (laughs) in it and like whatever, like writing it down. Or if you don't if you don't feel if you don't feel that you're going to receive it, you're never going to receive it. And one of the biggest lessons that I've learned about manifestation is that if you want something, you have to show up as the version of yourself that already has it. You know, how would I act if my podcast was as famous as Emma Chamberlain's podcast? Would I wake up at 10? Probably not. I would I would wake up earlier to like record. Um, what would I do if my clothing brand was as famous as We're Not Really Strangers? Would I be lazy all day and would I procrastinate? Probably not because I would have a lot of orders to fulfill, you know? What would that version of myself do? And then I just do it until I actually, until I, I'm actually living that life, until I actually receive those things. So it's like deciding what you want and then showing up as the version of yourself that already has it. 
amazing. It, it's something that I, I practice Christianity and something that I hear with mm -hmm. a lot of people who, who practice is they get confused with the sense of almost like entitlement where when they go to pray, they will just ask God for things. Well, they're going to say, oh, I need like I need 100 on my test tomorrow. Uh, I need the weather to be nice. I'm supposed to go out and like I, I just need X, Y and Z. That's not necessarily how I view praying in this case and the same thing it, 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 i don't think that's how you should view manifestation if, you, if that's what you're choosing to do where it's not an ask it's you being grateful for something that already exists and everything that is yet to come because you're just grateful for everything that has been given to you so far so why shouldn't you be mm -hmm. grateful for something that's yet to come and i know a lot of people when they go to build their business or they go to build up something that they're really passionate about they're so consumed with the end goal and then they get to the end goal and they're like why doesn't this feel as good as it should have? Like, what is going on right now? This isn't, this isn't it. And yeah. that's something that even you talked about where you got to this point where everything happened exactly yeah. how, how you want it to happen. And you didn't feel necessarily that level of satisfaction that you thought you were going to. And I was fascinated because your mom was the one who pointed mm -hmm. out that mm -hmm. <laughs> you weren't resting the way that you needed to, and you weren't taking care of your body that the way that you needed to. And we get so consumed with the journey and the end goal that sometimes we forget to balance everything out and everything only works when it's in balance. Now that you can reflect upon it and you've improved upon your rest, you've improved upon your personal balance, what's one message that you would give to somebody who's going through that same kind of hustle right now? They're building their own personal brand. They're trying to blow up on the internet to make something out of themselves. What's your advice now that you've been able to reach that point that you can tell someone don't make the same, I don't even want to call it mistakes, but don't mm -hmm. take the same actions that I did because it will pay off better in the long run. Well, my priority right now on top of my podcast and my brand and everything else is my mental peace. And I feel that because I have that so stable, I am able to make conscious decisions towards every aspect in my life and that like there's literally nothing more important right now than my mental peace and if for some reason this podcast burn, burns me out I'm gonna stop and if for some reason my brand burns me out again I'm gonna stop and I literally don't care about anything that it's not like my mental peace because I know that if you don't have that you don't have anything and even the things that you have you are not able to enjoy them like you're not, I had everything and I was super depressed and it's like priorities, you know, like at the time I feel like I valued money more than I valued myself. And I was like, I have to keep, I have to keep working because I'm making so much money at like this age. And it's like, what do you want to buy? Like, what do you <laughs> want to buy? But it's like, you're blind to you're, you're blinded. And it's like, right now I know that my priority and if I can give a, uh, an advice is like prioritize your mental peace, not your happiness, because happiness is a mood. Happiness is an emotion. I always say this. Happiness and sadness are emotions and emotions are literally energy and motion. So they come and they go. Right. But peace stays. And it's like no matter what you're doing, if you have mental peace, everything will turn out exactly how you want it to work to turn out. And if it doesn't, because of the mental peace that you have, you understand that it's for a reason. So that's my advice is like take care of your mental health first and then you're able to make conscious decisions everything will fall into place once yeah. you have everything up here settled yeah and, and money is such a like it's such a taboo but it's becoming more normalized where you go on <laughs> tiktok or instagram and it's like here's how i spent my uh, one hundred and seventy thousand dollars salary as a, as a 16 year old like, whatever <laughs> and you're just like how is this going on and everybody's so obsessed with money and finances and i can tell you right now i work with so many people who have progressed farther in their corporate careers who have left the corporate world to do exactly like you just said, just take a step back because you reach a point eventually where you say to yourself, why am I doing all this? Like I have a family, I have all my friends that are outside that I don't get to spend any time with them. You just need to take a step back. And like you said, if you can't figure out up here first, that having all the money in the world is not going to be a Exactly. <laughs> yeah. One of the things that you've talked about in terms of getting to that mental peace is connecting with your inner child and healing mm. your inner child. And this is something that I found wild and something that I want to try, <laughs> but I don't know how to prepare for it because it sounds like a, an incredibly emotionally taxing experience. And I want to ask you how, so I want to ask you to describe it to somebody who hasn't heard it before. And once you do, how do you go about 
preparing for that kind of exercise where you're going to have to face some past trauma if it does exist, or you're going to have to face some things in the past that you've been trying to suppress. Like we talked about before, you're trying to ignore some emotions that you've been suppressing for a while. How do you go about preparing yourself for that level of emotional intensity? Yeah, I mean, and I I genuinely feel like your healing journey doesn't start until you actually decide to connect with that inner child. And once you do decide to connect with your inner child and heal that, your spiritual awakening journey starts and you can move on feeling 100% free. And I mean, it is tough. It is a very emotionally tough, tough journey to, to realize that the traumas that I have right now are not necessarily mine right now, but because I didn't, I didn't heal them when they happened when I was nine, 10 years old, I feel them right now. Um, and I, I talk about mine, like I was super tough on myself. I was super tough on myself growing up. Literally, I was a nine, 10 year old girl speaking horribly to herself. And then I was wondering why was, why, why am I insecure now that I'm 16 years old? Well, because you literally grew up talking trash about yourself to yourself. And it's like, if you, if you didn't heal that, like, what are you, how, how was that supposed to change? And things with your parents that my dad did this and he never apologized and that scarred me and I never said anything. And five years later, it still hurts. It's like, it still hurts because it's not healed, you know? And it's like, you will realize once you start going through those patterns of like, I always attract these type of people. I always end up with this toxic guy, or I always end up with toxic friends, or I always end up in these type of situations. It probably has to do something with your inner child that you didn't heal. And that's why you keep repeating patterns and cycles and the same people, same relationships, same situations, because I feel like life is trying to show you that there's something that you haven't healed that you have to heal in order to move on and to attract different. When I was when I was little and I talk about this in an episode, when I was little, one of my biggest my biggest fears was that my parents got a divorce. Like that was one of my biggest fears and not because they had like a, a uh not, not because they they fought all the time or anything they they've always had a beautiful relationship for some reason the fact of them being divorced or separate just i i it was like horrible that thought was just horrible and so i i never told that to anyone i i, ne- I never expressed that i guess i i never healed that and i told my mom recently i was like you know what's crazy like when i was little one of my biggest fears was that you and dad got a divorce. How can that reflect on my life today? And she was like, well, maybe you keep attracting partners that um, you feel the need to fix so that they want to stay with you and they never want to separate because you're afraid of separation. Or um, you attract partners that don't necessarily want commitment and want separation. Or you attract like this certain type of people that I was attracting that my mom didn't even know about, but she was like describing the exact stereotype that I was attracting into my life. And I was like, that makes so much sense because I never healed that fear of my parents separating, which is ultimately that like fear of separation. I attract people into my life now that I'm either afraid to like separate or want to change them because of, because of like forcing them not to like separate from me. So it's like everything everything that you have right now in every single relationship that you attract or circumstance that you attract that you don't necessarily want or doesn't or maybe it's toxic or that you don't necessarily prefer has to do something with something that like has to do with something that you haven't healed i'm just thinking about myself now we're, we're about to have like therapy session it's just so powerful <laughs> <laughs> it, i'm just thinking about how when i was younger the first thing that came to my mind is i always constantly I still have it sometimes where I'll tell myself, I'm just not good enough in anything. I'm not good enough at being a friend. I'm not good enough at being a boyfriend. I'm not good enough at podcasting. I'm not good enough at playing sport. You name it. See, and, and that, and it, that not good. Sorry, I interrupt you no, because no. I had that same thought and I had to heal that too. That good enough will attract more situations into your life that prove to you that you're not good enough. And it's not necessarily that you're not good enough is that that's what you're attracting to prove to yourself that you're not good enough. Yeah. And I'm just thinking about 
it's not even the people that I attracted into my life. It's the people I pushed out where I would tell myself, no, nope, I'm not good enough for mm-hmm. that person. I'm mm-hmm. Not good enough to be, not good enough to be your boyfriend, not good enough uh, to be this person's friend, not good enough to be uh, a mentor to this person who's growing up and they're going through college, they're going through high school. What am I exactly. going to teach them? Stuff like that. Um, yeah, I, that's something I still need to face. <laughs> or, yeah, or and we and, and, and we tend to accidentally self-sabotage to prove our inner child's right to be like you had this fear and now i'm living this fear to prove you that your fear was right to have and it's like we are responsible for breaking that that cycle yeah. self-sabotage is a favorite hobby of mine <laughs> <laughs> absolutely and it, it's something that i've been trying to work on with with this especially my, my motto coming into this was just don't quit and yeah. it, it, was, it was the idea of just don't self-sabotage yourself. The only person who is going to really care at the end of the day if you quit is you. No one, mm-hmm. like we talked about in the beginning, no one's, it, I hope no one's focused on this 24-7, but it's just all a mental game. And if you can't master the mental game, you are missing out on the most beautiful parts in life. You you can be halfway across the world on vacation. If your mental game is off, you're not even going to enjoy the vacation. You can move yeah. halfway across the country. And if you're there, if you have to bring your mind with you and it's not right. You're not even going to enjoy the new city that you're in. It's a crazy phenomenon and we don't understand our minds the way that we should. And again, it's something that you've talked about is we don't even understand that there's two parts of our mind that we have to understand the conscious and the subconscious. And it's really the subconscious. That's the one pulling the strings and you don't even know about it. Absolutely. Can you talk about what you've learned about the subconscious just through your experiences and your research and what is the impact that the subconscious has on our own mental state throughout our day-to-day when, when we're sitting in class when we're working on our personal projects what is the subconscious doing to us that we're not even uh, knowing about yeah well i mean our life is a reflection of our subconscious mind and the beliefs that we have in our subconscious mind and our subconscious mind does not know when we're joking or not and that's why self-talk is so important and the people that you allow into your life are so important because like And you hear it all the time, people saying, I hate myself, even if it's not true, even if it's a joke, your mind, your subconscious mind does not process and doesn't know the difference between whether you're joking or not. And if you keep saying, I hate myself, I can't do this. This is so hard. I'm going to fail my test. You are going to fail. You're going to fail your test to prove your subconscious mind right. It doesn't know the difference between whether you're joking or not. And that's like one of the biggest lessons that I've learned about our subconscious mind is that I have to, if if we talk to ourselves negatively as a joke, why can't we talk to ourselves positively as a joke? Like it, instead of saying, oh, I hate myself, just say, oh, I'm so pretty. Oh, I love myself. Yeah. And it's like, why is that so hard to like, why, why is that so like hard of a, of a change? And it's like, that's what I've learned is that our, our life is a reflection of our subconscious mind and of, of our beliefs. And like a great way to hack into our subconscious mind is meditation and sleeping with affirmations and just constantly repeating yourself, I'm good enough, I'm good enough, I'm good enough, until you truly believe that that you are. And there's ways to reprogram your subconscious mind, again, by meditation and by affirmations. But knowing that also our brain is wired for comfort and not happiness. And so any situation that we're comfortable with, whether it's toxic relationship, whether it's toxic friendships, whether it's toxic environments, if we're if that's what we're comfortable in because we've been in it for so long, that's what we're going to want to go back to until we, again, know that it's a pattern that's engraved in our subconscious mind and that's what it feels comfortable to our subconscious mind and not necessarily because we want it, but it's because we're comfortable in it. Um, and so that's why you see people breaking up with their toxic ex and and being back with them like a week later, it's like they don't necessarily want to go back, but it's like their subconscious mind is telling them to go back because that's what feels safe. That's what feels comfortable. And it's like understanding that our brain is not wired for happiness. It's wired for comfort. And the only way that you're going to be happy is if you start controlling your mind and understanding that when you put yourself in a uncomfortable situation, then the outcome will actually be dif- be different. My book recommendation for you is one that was recommended to me by my high school baseball coach. 
and it was about this exact topic. It's called The Power of Your Subconscious Mind. And the author is Dr. Joseph Murphy. Mm -hmm. and, and I've been listening to the audiobook. I've been taking oh, notes really? too. I have my, yeah, I have my little notebook here. I love it. Uh, <laughs> yeah, for anybody listening, it's a must do. The The reason our baseball coach had, had us read it is there's a lot of famous athletes and sports psychologists that preach the idea of visualization where we would have to, but even before we started practicing, we had to sit down for 15 minutes and we would just all sit in a circle and we just do like breathing exercises and we would just visualize us and we were playing baseball. So us getting like the game winning hit, us making a, a very nice catch. And I'm not even joking. There are some scenarios that we used to visualize that would happen and we were ready for it because we visualized it. Over mm -hmm. and over again, and yeah. Over again. And there's scenarios in the book where he talks about uh, a woman who's diagnosed with cancer and she just tells herself, I don't have cancer. No, I don't have cancer. I could beat cancer. She beats it. Something yeah. that was told that she was never going to beat. She just told herself, no, nah, I think so. I think, I think otherwise. It's amazing what you tell your mind to do and your mind just kind of snaps and says, oh, that is right. Like you're telling me what I need to do. You control your mind a lot more than your mind controls you. And it's one thing to be able to understand this at your age, but it's another thing to be able to communicate this to your audience, which mm -hmm. I think is just incredible. And I, I can't commend you enough for being able to do it. Your audience is asking you questions uh, on a wide variety of spectrums. They love asking you about breakups. They love asking you about how to handle their emotions. They love asking you just any kind of topic in the world. And now you're doing your advice sections on, on Thursdays. <laughs> when all these people are coming to you, I want to ask you just about your mental health again. A, a lot of people are now in a position where they're looking at you for advice and they're looking at you to be that guiding light for them. It's a lot of pressure to put mm -hmm. on somebody. How have you gone about balancing that act of being there for them, but at the same time, you have to make sure that's not harming your own personal emotional health where you're not putting yourself first, where you're too focused on being there for all these people, but you have to be there for you first and foremost. It's a tough balancing act. Uh, I'm just interested to hear how it's been going so far. For sure. And I honestly did not expect to get as many DMs as I as I get. I have like hundreds of DMs like every single day and I don't have time to read through all of them. And I also won't answer the DMs that I, I don't have the answer to because I don't have the answer to anything. I wish I did. I'm still learning. I'm still healing as well. And when I can answer... I will. But again, it all comes down to like prioritizing my mental health. And if, if today I'm having a good day and I feel like responding to DMs, I will. And if tomorrow I don't, then I, I won't. And it's like, if that gets some people upset, then I'm so sorry. But my mental health comes first. And it's about how much time I have. It's about like how, how well I'm feeling. And I'm not a therapist, you know, <laughs> I'm just yeah. someone that's sharing um, her thoughts and her lessons. And, you know, I try to give the best advice that I can. And I try to respond as, as many messages as, as I get. And I try to include as, as many questions as I, as I read, but I'm also not a therapist. And I keep reminding myself that because sometimes I feel so guilty of like not responding or like I read a, a DM from a girl that's like, I've been, I've, I, I'm going through a five-year breakup and I see my ex every single day and I, I don't know what to do. What, what's your advice? And I'm like, I, I don't know. I don't know because that has never happened to me and I can just tell you what I would do. But also if you don't like that advice, then that's like more pressure to me. It's like, I'm not a therapist. I really don't know. <laughs> and, and it's like then reminding myself of like, you're not a therapist and it's not your responsibility. And like the fact that you're deciding to share your lessons on social media does not make you responsible for anyone else's lessons, you know? So it's yeah. like just reminding myself what I do and who I am and what my purpose is with the podcast. And like, I'm not responsible for anything else as, as harsh as that might sound, but it's like, you know, it, I'm not a therapist. No, the, the truth, the truth is harsh sometimes. And, and <laughs> I, you had a whole episode about it where it's, it's not personal. Like right. as much as you want to help as much as you can, but you have, 300,000 people who are following you. If you got 1% of those people DMing you per day, that's, I, I suck at math. That's 300 people. Might be more. I don't know. <laughs> that's a lot of, that's a lot of people in a 24 hour window. And you, you can't sit there all day and respond as thoroughly and as thoughtfully as you would like to. It's just impossible. Mm -hmm. And it's a really, it's a really tough balancing act. And I, I, I commend you just for being able to even take the time out of your day to get back to, to even some people who mm -hmm. are looking up to you because it really means a lot. 
when you see that message come in and you just see that someone took the time to acknowledge you, people are always just looking for a little sense of acknowledgement. Maybe that's lacking yeah. in their day-to-day -day life. If you could provide that to people, that that's an amazing feeling. Hmm. And I, I think a lot of your viewers definitely appreciate that. Uh, the podcast is, is going super well for you. It's something that I've certainly become a huge fan of. Hmm. I know a lot of other people have become a fan of. Hmm. Where do you see the, the future of your podcast going in relation to the brand itself? Do you see more of a crossover between the two? Um, I know they're both very centered around self-help, mental health. Uh, do you ever see maybe more collaborations that could be coming in place just in terms of maybe you bring on someone who, who's going to model for the brand, you bring them on to do the podcast or just, just how do you think about like business strategy at all if, you, if you've ever thought about it in that way? I mean, maybe I, my brand is something more corporate, I want to call it. And yeah. it, it, it involves a lot of people and I have, I'm actually going through a huge rebranding and this is the first time that I'm going to uh, share this on social media, but it's going to be called No Name Project. So Miley, the brand is, yeah, it's transforming into a whole new different thing. Um, and I have, a, like I said, my dad is like a very big part of the business and I have a whole team like behind my brand. So it's like I make the decisions, but I have a lot of people like helping me out with the business and how to grow and social media and like photography and whatever. And it's obviously a project that I adore and that I love, but my podcast is mine, you know, yeah. and I, I obviously started the podcast with like the vision of like people are going to listen to this because I obviously everybody wants to be successful. Everybody wants to be like listened to and it, every, it's <laughs> yeah. everyone's goal when they started podcast to be listened to. But I also, it's also like my, my own little like therapy session where I just sit um, with my camera and with my microphone and I just talk and talk and talk and it's mine. It's mine. My podcast is mine. It's like my time, my thoughts, my advice me with myself and it's like I don't have anyone involved with it other than my sponsors um where I like monetize a podcast and it's like but they they don't have anything to do with like the podcast itself and the recording or anything it's like it's my time it's me time I like I lock myself in my office and I start recording and I it's generally something that, that I enjoy so would I ever cr cross both of them I mean, I think it would be a very beautiful project and obviously I want, I would want guests on my podcast and I, I, I already started recording some, some, uh, episodes with guests from other podcasts, but I, I don't feel like I would share this project with anyone else yet just because I, I, I just feel like it's my own little thing, you know? <laughs> oh, absolutely. <laughs> I, I mean, this, this is my lo own little thing. Mm -hmm. And of course, I've thought about one day having, bringing people on if I ever got to that point. And yeah. I think it would be a beautiful thing. Yeah. But it's difficult to give up ownership of something that you've created and something mm -hmm. that you've built. It, it's your it's your baby. Like, yeah. it's, it's something that yeah. you've, if you've raised. And I think everybody should find that thing for them, whether it's a podcast. Yeah, for that, sure. Whether it, it, it's starting just something that's a hobby for them. It It's such a powerful tool. And where I think a lot of people that I know in my own personal circles get caught up is we go to work nine to five, sometimes plus you're there for a long time and you let that grind just bring you down mm. and something doesn't go right during the workday. Something doesn't go right with your relationship with your boss and maybe someone outside of work is really mad at you and now that's coming into your work life and you don't have that thing to fall back on when you're done. You're just consumed with, okay, I got home. Now I have like two hours to like watch Netflix or something and then I'm just going to go to sleep wake up, do it all over again. And that's what people refer to as like the rat race where mm -hmm. they just get stuck in that wheel. It, it's one thing to get stuck in that rat race, but I'm telling you just to anybody listening, just grab that one thing. Th this is my one thing right now. I, I still work <laughs> nine to five, but this is my one thing that brings me back down and says, okay, you know, I'm going to do this now. I'm going to build upon it and knock on wood one day. This is going to be my thing that I can monetize and I can grow it and make it Please, something incredible. Yes. Yeah. If you don't do that for yourself, again, you're selling yourself short so much and i'm not even talking about like just doing something on the weekends i'm talking about coming home at the end of the day and if you have an hour just pick up a new skill just start doing something not like a skill that you need to monetize itself but just something that provides you with a sense of purpose a sense of joy this whole podcast is shaped around the idea of joy what can bring you joy if something's lacking right now and not bringing you joy and these skills and these hobbies are cru they're more crucial than anything else in the world like we talked about over and over again today is just mental peace outside of podcasting outside of tennis i, I know those are two big things for you is there anything else that you turn to just to relax your mind to just really settle down maybe when days are getting stressful what's that thing 
outside of the two that I just mentioned, that might be something that you turn to and it just helps you reset. Well, I just love um, creating content is just something that I love. Yeah. Um, and I also have my personal brand on TikTok that it's where I create my own little content and I have fun. I have a lot of fun with that, but I love spend time. I love to spend time with my friends. I love my friends. I love to spend time with my family going out and like putting my phone away, deleting social media. I don't have, I, I recently deleted Snapchat. I deleted Be Real. I'm, I was this close to deleting Instagram and I can't because of work, but it's like, I try to put my phone away as much as I, I can. I try to be present no matter what I'm doing. Um, but just spending time with the people I love and that I know that love me is just like, I, I love. Yeah. I, I, you know, I started doing it cause I get the same kind of feeling where I'm like, mm -hmm. I'm on Instagram and TikTok too much. I, I set like those timers where I only give myself like 15 minutes to yeah. basically like just to mm -hmm. do the work that I yeah. need to. And then I have to put it down and I have to like yeah. actually go be present mm -hmm. and do everything like that. Um, it's a game. <laughs> it's a game <laughs> being present in the world and actually going outside and seeing it. Um, with the brand specifically, this is one of the last questions I want to ask you just about creativity. Cause I find people's creativity is, is a beautiful thing. <laughs> I, I want to know about like, just when you craft a video or when you craft a photo shoot, what do you look for just in terms of like changing up a little, like how do you get the inspiration behind them? Um, especially in like a photo shoot where you have a lot of creative freedom, uh, whether it's for the brand or just your personal brand, does a lot of planning go into it or is it more spur of the moment? Maybe you see something that day and you're like, this, that's it. Like, I'm just going to go, I need to plan it out right now, get the team together and we'll go shoot something. Um, how does that kind of work? That's something I'm not very creative in terms of photography and playing that stuff out. So that's something that really fascinates me. Yeah, and that's something that I'm very grateful and blessed about too, is that I have the privilege to be my own like creative director. And if I want my podcast to look this way, that's how it's going to look like. And if I want my brand to look this way, that's how it's going to look like. So, I mean, and I am such a creative person and I love that about myself that I'm, I, I'm thinking about ideas of how I want this to look all the time. And I'm also very blessed that I have a sister that's a photographer and that's able to bring my ideas into life. And that's how I uh, recently just launched the new season on my podcast, which like the pictures are literally what I envisioned. And it's like, I spend most of my time literally on Pinterest, just looking, <laughs> looking at ideas of like, I want season three to be like super self-centered how would the picture how would these pictures look and then i just start looking for inspo and once i find it i am super impatient so i go to buy the stuff like that i need uh the day after and then i plan a photo shoot like two days later that that's how my mind works and it's like i get an idea i'm super impatient i have to do it right away and i have people around me that just help me because they believe in me and i am just so grateful about that too it's a beautiful thing Mm -hmm. now, once again, we'll have all your socials linked down in the description mm -hmm. for anybody who wants to check it out. It's at Molly the Brand. <laughs> yeah, it's at I Missed Me Podcast. It's at Mafe and Zoras. Mm -hmm. I'll be down in the description. Thank you again for joining me. Last question. It's a question that you've been throwing out recently. And I want to ask you because it's been all over your, your pages. What's one situation that has completely changed you as a person? Um, There's a couple. And I always say my breakup, but I don't want to give my ex that amount of. <laughs> Doesn't deserve the screen time. <laughs> I, I give him way too like too much screen time, literally. But I would say I would say my breakup. And as much as I I hate bringing it up, it's becoming kind of repetitive, and he does not deserve. It. I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, yeah, I would say my breakup just because, not of the breakup itself, but the lessons that came with it of like heartbreak really changes you as a person and it's the most humbling thing ever <laughs> because yeah. it makes you realize like that there are things about yourself that you that you have to fix and I feel like um I I was always so uh like such a rebel with my parents of like when they would tell me that I had to fix something about myself I'd be like oh, they're just saying it because they're my parents when my sisters would tell me, oh, they're just saying it because they're my sisters. And when someone that like my ex comes into your life and like loves you, but is a like, but decides to leave your life because you have this, this and this to change about yourself, then you're like, oh shit. So then maybe I do have to change this about myself. And it's not because of the fact that he left that I was heartbroken. It was more because of 
the realization of like I do have to work on myself and and working on yourself and healing is not easy at all so I feel like that's one situation that has completely changed me as a person is like I would not be the person that I am today and I would not have this podcast and I would not have anything that I have today if it wasn't because of that breakup because I was very comfortable with the person that I was even if I was not the best person um I was very comfortable with being like that and nothing had nothing bad had happened to me until then so I was like so it's okay to be this way like I can be selfish and I can be self-centered and I can be narcissistic and I can be this way because nothing has happened to me and then someone comes and tells you that you're this this and that and they actually leave your life and not stay like every other person has they actually leave you're like oh maybe I do have to change (laughs) maybe I do have to work on myself maybe I do have to be better and now I am and I I can I proudly say that I am and I'm I'm sure that I am and I I proudly say that I am a better person now because I know the amount of pain and and healing that I had to go through to get to this point Thank you once again to Mafe for joining me for today. It was such a pleasure, such an incredible conversation. And I'm on my way to Barnes & Noble right after recording this to get my copy of The Secret. Everyone listening, you should do so as well. Once again, if you enjoyed the conversation, please follow along and leave a rating. It really means the world to me. It helps me grow the show and helps me get so many incredible guests for all of you to enjoy the conversations. Once again, it really is such a pleasure to be able to do this for you all. I can't thank you enough. Until next time, I'll see you.